Today we're in chapter 11. Let's begin reading here in uh, Ezekiel chapter 11 at verse 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 4 and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faces eastward. And there at the door of the gate were 25 men, um, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pilatia, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city, who say, The time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron. We are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Now, what we're, to, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at the departure of the glory of God from the temple there in the city of Jerusalem. And as I was beginning to think about it just a moment ago, as I was about to come out, I began to think about how unbelievable and how sad and how terrible that really would be. We, we've been looking at how, how God had presented Himself in His, what is called the Shekinah glory of God in in the, in the tabernacle and how incredibly brilliant and glorious it was when God visited the tabernacle and then when the nation of Israel through Solomon had built the temple, a, a place, a structure of worship there in the city of Jerusalem, how that once again the glory of the Lord had filled that place and as the glory of God had filled that place and His presence was there in such a powerful way, how the people were just overwhelmed with God's presence. And it's difficult for me to put into words how incredible that must have been and how sad this chapter is because God's glory is about to depart. You think in terms of, of projects that you have. The, the temple took years to build. And when it was finally built, how they dedicated to God and, and God was there in that special way. And, and I was thinking of how that that here as a fellowship we had taken some time to, to build, to construct this, this sanctuary that we are in right now and how much time went into it and how much devotion and prayer and, and preparation, all the planning and praying and, and then all of the work. And I, I can remember as, as we were building this particular building that we now occupy and have been occupying now for the last few years, I can still remember standing outside looking in this direction at just a, 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 just just dirt. It was just dirt. And then how that Mike Callahan and I would sometimes just stand out there and there was how they had built a mound, which is what I'm standing on right here. And, and I remember the first time we walked over here and he said, you see that mound of dirt there? That's going to be where the platform is. And you have to picture this. There was nothing here except a mound of dirt. And I remember walking onto this mound of dirt, kind of where I am right now. And I said, so about right here will be where my, my pulpit is, huh? And he goes, yeah, right there. And you're out there in the open, and all you have is some dirt that's been, you know, compressed. And, and I'm standing in the open on a pile of dirt, and I'm, and I'm thinking, one of these days, we're going to have a building built around here. One of these days, it's going to, you know, it's going to have sound, and it's going to have lighting, and it's going to have air conditioning, it's going to have carpeting and walls, and it's going to have pews. One of these days, but right now, it's just just a pile of dirt, and, and I remember standing there just looking towards Mike and pretending I was preaching to him, and, and he walked out on me while I was teaching. Can you believe that? But how exciting it was for me at that moment. And then all of the construction and, and, and how we would come and how we watched them lift up the walls and how they, they put the concrete down and how we saw them carpeting and, and then putting in all of the pews and and how we all had come up here, so many of us had come up here in the platform area before we had put the rug in, and we had all of those little markers, and, and some brought their own. They had been marking up walls down the street. They decided to come and put a scripture here. And, and how the people were writing all over here their scriptures, and how I have right where I stand here a scripture that relates to the foundation being Jesus Christ. And every time that I teach, I, I know that I'm standing on, on the Word of God in a literal sense, a, a promise of God to remember to build on no other foundation other than that which has been laid, and that is Jesus Christ. Every time I open the Word of God, and every guest speaker that we've ever had stands on top of that one Scripture that God has established for us a foundation, 
in Jesus Christ. The excitement of it. When we had our dedication service here, how that my pastor Chuck Smith had come and had given a message. We had time of worship and praise and celebration and excitement. How that when we celebrated our 25th anniversary, how we packed the place out here and we worshiped and, and sang praises to God. How many people we have seen come to faith in Christ here in this ministry over the years. How we've seen literally thousands of people who have given the heart to Jesus Christ sometimes a hundred at a time. We have seen that so many times over the years. We've seen ministers and missionaries leave our fellowship and go into foreign lands to take the gospel out and to minister the Word of God. We've seen so much over the years. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, how terrible it would be for the glory of God to depart for the glory of God to depart, all you'd be left with is a beautiful building, but nothing else. And that's what we're seeing take place here, the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is a, a, a nation that had a tremendous relationship with God, a special, unique relationship with God, as the Scripture declares, that they were the people that God had worked with in a unique fashion. When Paul was speaking about the privileges of this, this nation, he had said in Romans 9, verse 4, that God gave the Israelites the adoption, the Shekinah glory, the covenants, the law, the priesthood, promises. He had given them promises of Messiah, of Messiah's kingdom, of eternal life that you can have in him. The nation of Israel had received such tremendous privileges and so many promises. And so of, of all the nations on the earth, God had chosen to reveal himself to this nation, this small nation, this insignificant group of people. But God had chosen to reveal himself to them. And one of the ways in which he chose to do so was through prophets. The Bible tells us in the New Testament book of Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 1, that God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. The prophets spoke for God. The prophets were given special information concerning what God wanted to do and was about to do. And sometimes the prophets would give a word to the nation that was so hope-filled, so encouraging. Hundreds of prophecies were given concerning Messiah who is to come and how God was going to work through this Messiah. Hundreds of encouraging words from God to the nation of Israel. And then many times, God would speak words concerning judgment that he'd have to bring on a nation that had turned their backs on him. And, and here in the book of Ezekiel, that's what we see. Ezekiel has been given a message concerning a coming judgment, a judgment that is coming on the nation of Israel, a, a judgment that is coming from the north through, through a, a great and mighty nation called Babylon. And God had been speaking to Ezekiel, this prophet, and had said that he's bringing judgment from the north. You see, Ezekiel had been an inhabitant of of the nation of Israel, but had been taken captive and was now living in Babylon, actually was about 50 miles south of the city of Babylon in, in a place that he refers to as Tel Aviv. And you saw that in chapter 3 and verse 15. And, and though he is there in Babylon, we've seen that God in a vision has transported him to Jerusalem. So we can see what's taking place in the city of Jerusalem so far away. And what God is doing is he's revealing to him that the city and that nation is to be severely judged. And again, we have to ask the question, why? Why was God going to judge this nation, nation that he set his affection on, a nation that he raised up amongst all nations, a nation that was, was made significant by his presence, not by their own personal greatness? Now, why is God going to do that? And the answer, as we've been seeing here in the book of Ezekiel, is that they had forsaken the Lord. And they had forsaken him, so he's about to forsake them. Now, they've been warned. Early in their history, God had warned them that this would take place. 
When God began to speak to them and minister to them through Moses, it's found in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy in chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. God had said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. This people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I've made with them. And then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. He said, they will forsake me, and I will forsake them because of their idolatry. In 2 Kings, in chapter 21, 14, and 15, God said, I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance, deliver them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt even to this day. God is bringing judgment. God is removing His glory from the nation. He's already begun to move His glory. He's removing it slowly from the threshold of the door to the east gate of the Lord's house. His glory began to depart. But as this is taking place, God has continued giving Ezekiel visions concerning this coming judgment. And that's what Ezekiel is speaking about. So here in verse 1, he says in chapter 11, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faces eastward, and there at the door of the gate were 25 men, among whom I saw Jaazania, which I would prefer calling Phil. It's easier. And Pilatia. And so he mentions a couple of men here, and these men that are mentioned here he is referring to them, and notice in verse 1 how he refers to them as princes of the people. In other words, these are noblemen. These are significant individuals who have a tremendous influence over the other people. So he's speaking concerning the movers and shakers, and that these two men in particular are being referred to, so it lets us know that they are men of high prestige and honor amongst the people. And so what's happening is, is he's at the gate that faces east. This is where the priests would enter in and exit from. It's an area there that is, is an open area for, for the people, uh, the men to assemble. And as he's there in this particular area facing the Mount of Olives, he sees these 25 men. Now, the two men that are mentioned, Jozania and, and, and Pilati, are, are the ones who are giving fatal advice to the people of Israel. And you'll see that in verse 2, and it says, He said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city, who say, the time is not near to build houses. The city is the cauldron. We are the meat. And so notice what he says about these men. He says, they devise iniquity and they give wicked counsel. Now, on the one hand, this kind of thing goes on constantly. I mean, it's not just true during the day of Ezekiel. Where, where people give bad advice and wicked counsel and, and their hearts are, are prone towards evil. We see that all the time. People devise iniquity all the time. That's, that's pretty much common uh, amongst average people. You, you, you know that to be true. You, you can have friends who will tell you, you know what, man, it's such a great day today. It's a good day today. We ought to go to the beach. You know, just call your boss up and tell him you're sick. Take a sick day, you know, lie to him, tell him, that you're not feeling well, or it's a great day to go skiing or whatever, you know. So you got friends who will tell you that. Lie to the boss. Or, or they'll tell you, you know, your parents really, you know, aren't going to want you to go here to do that. So just lie to them. Tell them you're going to be doing something else. Many of us have friends who devise iniquity. You have a, a co-worker who says to you, tell your husband that you're going to go visit a sick friend. Or, or tell your wife that you have to work late. I remember that there was a bar that was named The Office. <laughs> so that when the guy called the wife, she could say, where are you? I'm at The Office, which was true. It was at a bar called The Office. But it's a way of devising evil. You know, there is a, and I'm not going to give you the address for it, <laughs> but there is a, um, a website 
that gives you alibis. Some of you know this. Some of you have used it. But what you do is you contact this particular website for a fee. They will give you a phone number that you can give to your wife or husband and tell them, you're going for the weekend for a business trip. If you need to get hold of me, here's the number. And so if the wife wants to check up on the husband, she calls the number, and somebody who's already got the script in front of them will answer as per the script, knowing who this woman is who's calling, knowing what she's calling for, and will provide an alibi for a price. Devising wickedness. Devising iniquity. Now, I see some of you writing that down. Why are you doing that? <laughs> but that's what they do. They'll set up a lie for you. They'll set up an alibi for a small fee. Devising iniquity. But in the case of these men, they're giving ungodly counsel to the people of the city of Jerusalem. And the counsel actually is contradicting what God was saying through his prophets. You see, Jeremiah has been prophesying that the nation is going to be in exile for 70 years. And he's been making that very clear that that's what's going to take place, that this exile is going to take place for 70 years. You see that in Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 14. But, but these men are contradicting what, what God is expressly saying. And that's why God says they're devising iniquity and they're giving wicked counsel. The reason that they're giving wicked counsel is because they are disregarding the Word of God. And so when you disregard God's Word and give advice contrary to it or speak contrary to it, well, God would say they're giving wicked counsel. What's the very first thing that is questioned in the Scriptures? What is the very first thing that you'll ever find questioned in this Bible, in this book that we read, the very first thing that you ever see questioned is the Word of God. The very first thing is what Satan said to Eve when he said to her, has God said? The very first thing that you find questioned in this book called the Bible is the Word of God. And so when you contradict what the Word of God is and when you give counsel that is contrary to it, well, the Lord God says to us that that's wicked counsel. Now, they're saying something here in verse 3. They're saying the time is not near to build houses. You see, God had said, settle down where you're at because you're going to be there for a long time. Settle down and build your houses because Jerusalem is not going to be recovered or given back to you for 70 years. That came through Jeremiah in chapter 29. So God has been saying, settle down and build houses but they're saying, no, the time is not near to build houses. Thus, they're contradicting God. When they say the city is the cauldron and we are the meat, basically they're saying this cauldron, which is a, a cooking pot, which protects the meat from the flame, they're saying Jerusalem is protecting us from being burned. Jerusalem, the city, because it belongs to God and is a holy site and because the temple is there, is going to be the city that God will not allow to be destroyed is what they're saying Nebuchadnezzar will not come in and will not destroy us. And therefore, what you're hearing from Jeremiah and others, uh, what you're hearing from them is incorrect. So they're devising evil and they're contradicting God. And that's why he says that this is wrong because the heart of their counsel is unbelief because they're rejecting the things of God. They're rejecting the word of God. And so God says this is what they're saying. And so in verse 4 he says, Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man, then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and, and said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord, Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in the city, and you have filled its streets with the slain. So he's to speak out. He's to speak out against the wicked princes. He's to let them know that they're wrong. And God is aware of the contempt that they're showing towards his warnings. God is aware of the things that they're saying about him and how they're rejecting those things. Remember in chapter 9, verse 9, how, how he says, He said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and, and the city full of perversity. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord doesn't see. And so God is aware of the fact of the things that they're saying. He's aware of their contempt. 
He's aware of their thoughts. He's aware of their unbelief. He's aware of their rejection of him. I wonder how many of us, I wonder how many believers in this nation, how many, how many who are professing Christians, how many who have said, I do love the Lord and I do desire to know him, Sometimes I wonder how many, how many really read his word? How many really do spend time meditating on it? How many, how many make a habit of picking it up and looking at it and reading and praying and asking God for direction and, 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 and seeing your, your heart exposed and, and seeing what he actually says and what he actually believes? for us to embrace and to hold fast to. Yeah, I heard a song. It's not a spiritual song. About a man who is old and he dies. And um, he had built with his own hands a table. It was a, it was a table that his family used to gather around, and uh, it was a place where he would hear the laughter of his children, a place that he enjoyed. For me, as I was listening to that song, I couldn't help but think of our dining room table and, and our Thanksgivings and our Christmas holidays that we've had, where we have to bring out the chairs because we've got my grandbabies in you know, my family there. Some of you know what I'm trying to say. It's just, for me, that is a very special season. It's a very special time. Well, this man had built a, 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 a table made out of oak. It was, it was fashioned with his own hands. He built the four legs to hold it up. He, he worked on the, the tabletop so it was strong and sturdy. And, and it was a place where he and his family would gather for meals and and in the song, it speaks concerning how this old man would sit there and he would listen to his children laugh and, and how deeply it would touch him and how much it meant to him. And then the man in the song, the man dies. He's an old man and he dies. And, uh, and nobody, none of his family comes when he dies. He dies alone. And they never know that in this table, underneath it, he had carved on the table for my children. For my children. They didn't care. And when I heard that, and I heard the song, for some reason, I must have been in one of those melancholic moods, I started thinking about that. How that, that, we, that we have something that we fashion with our own hands. Lives that God gave to us that we use, and we invest our lives in other people. We do. We invest our, our lives. As you grow older, there are more that you invest in. You invest your life in, in other people. You invest your life in your parents, in your children. Ultimately, a, a parent will invest their life in their kids. And in the back of their mind, they're fashioning a life, a heritage. They're, they're laying down a legacy. They're giving a tradition. And it may be encapsulated in an image of a table. And they don't know it, but you have placed them inside that table where nobody can see it. You have written there, for my children. For my children. And they don't want it. They don't want the table. They don't want what you fashioned. They don't even care to show up at your funeral. And what was valuable to you was not valuable to them. What meant something to you didn't mean anything to them. And I was thinking about that today. And I was thinking how I hope that whatever it is that I have fashioned as a legacy, that those for whom it has been prepared well, I pray that they see the value of it and that they want it and that it means something to them.
God gave to the nation of Israel his word, his presence, his glory. He gave to them the covenants and the priesthood. He gave them all that that nation needed. But that nation didn't want him. That nation didn't love him. That nation didn't care about his word. This young lady had a belief all of her life that her father had abandoned her. And he would mail her letters. But she never read them. She put them in a little shoe box. She never read them. They were just in a box. And when she became older, she finally met her father. And now she's angry at him, and she's saying to him, why didn't you ever try to contact me? Why didn't you ever try to speak to me? And he says, I never was able to. I was incapable of doing so. There were people who were keeping me from being near you. Your mother didn't want me near you. The best that I could ever do was send you a letter. I sent you letters every week. Did you not ever read them? She said, those things I threw in a box. He said, you ought to read them because they're my heart. And so she did. As she's reading, she finds out that he was there at plays that she was in. She just never knew he was in the back row. He was there at the different sports things that she did in high school. She never saw him because nobody would tell her that he was there. But he'd say, I saw you today. I saw what you did. I watched you play. And she began to realize all of these letters of love the father had sent to her had been disregarded and rejected because she just never took the time to read his letters. How many letters has God written to us that we just don't take the time to read? We just don't take the time. You know, the book, his Bible, sits on the shelf, unread. Letter after letter after letter, written in blood for us. Well, the nation of Israel didn't read his letters. They didn't care. They didn't care about what God had to say. They went chasing after false gods. And because of that, their unbelief, they ended up rejecting him. When he says in verse 6 and 7, you have multiplied your slain in the city, you have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in its midst, their meat. This city is the cauldron, but, but I shall bring you out of the midst of it. He's saying you've ignored my gracious call to repentance. Therefore, you are responsible for those who are dying. Judgment will come, and the only ones safe from Nebuchadnezzar are those who have already died. And those who survive its destruction will be brought out by force. In 2 Kings, in chapter 25, verses 9 through 11, we see this literally taking place. It speaks concerning the captain of the guard for Nebuchadnezzar, how he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. In verse 8, continuing, you have feared the sword. I will bring a sword upon you, says the Lord God, and I will bring you out of its midst and deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgments on you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord. So the sword of judgment will fall. You will be powerless to escape it. Some of those who are being taken captive will be executed outside of the city by Israel's borders. Verse 11, this city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know <clears throat> that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes, nor executed my judgments, but have done according to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all 
around you. The city is not going to provide protection for you. I am going to judge you. And again, the reason God says I'm going to bring this judgment is you didn't care about my word. In Psalm 106, verses 35 and 36, it says, They mingled with the Gentiles, learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. We are part of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of it. We haven't been taken out of this world we're part of it. We have a purpose. We're to be salt. We're to be light. We have a purpose. We're to live for Christ in such a way that people see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We have a purpose. We're to take this message, living it out and giving it out in such a way that people who don't know the Lord have an opportunity to come to a relationship with Him. God has given to us this purpose. God has told us to go forth, take His Word, live it and give it and and that's what we do. But the world is so constantly attacking, so constantly oppressing, so constantly giving its message. It's a 24-hour-a-day message. And it's interesting how Christianity is presented in the midst of this message. For those of you who took the time to watch American Idol, Anybody here ever watch that? I found it interesting because I was watching the news and there was a new news, uh, you know, a portion of the news dedicated to American Idol, which I thought was rather interesting. And, and they began to discuss something on that that I found fascinating. It was called the Christian vote. I don't know if any of you heard this concerning American Idol. But they were pointing out that, I, I don't know, I forget how many people have been contestants on and won, but something like seven or eight of them Seven or eight, there have been seven or eight contests and seven or eight who have been declared to be, quote-unquote, the American Idol. And one of the people who was being uh, uh, interviewed relating to that said, he said this, I don't know how accurate it is or not, I really don't, but he said five out of the, the, those who have won, five of them have been Christians, is what he said. He said, and right now, the, the, there are people who are wondering concerning, and this is interesting, concerning the Christian vote. For a young man named Adam and another young man named Chris. Adam has pretty, he has pictures of him, you know, kissing another guy. He's fascinated with makeup and, you know, he's, they believe that he, he's a, a homosexual young man. Chris, on the other hand, the guy said is, the guy said is a Christian. And he says, and what it's shaping up to be is a, an interesting question as to who's going to win. And the way they were posing this was so interesting to me because they were saying, because Christians do not go for the homosexual lifestyle, I wonder how many of them are going to vote for Chris based on that. And they were discussing that. And I thought, isn't that interesting how they're posing this particular thing? Because I watched the American Idol through the whole season. I got nothing better to do with my life. <laughs> and I was telling that to Marie. I said, it's interesting how they're, 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 I said, this seems to me, this is just my opinion, this seems to me that it's a setup. It's like they're going for this one guy that is obviously a Christian, and then they have another guy who quite obviously is, and I said, it seems like a, a setup. Even to the last song that they sang last night, which was actually keyed for the voice of Adam. Adam could sing this song a lot better than Chris. It's his style. And I said, isn't this interesting? I wonder what's going to happen because they said they're wondering about how many Christians are going to be voting and whether this young man who seems to be a Christian, Chris, how, if he's going to win or not. And I was thinking about how the whole world seems to be, you know, posed in that way. Are you, are you a Christian? At least in the United States it's posed this way. Are you a Christian or are you not? What do you really believe? What do you really hold fast to? What is it that you really hold fast with all of your heart? 
Do you believe this or do you not believe this? Even in the way it's presented today, people begin to question what your faith is all about based on the things that you do, the things that, you're, that you believe, the way that you live. That's just the way it is. And so, so when we're in the world, we are in the world, but we are not of it. We're supposed to have an influence on it, and it can be done in so many various ways. Now, he says in verse 13, it happened while I was prophesying that uh, Pilatia, the son of Benia, died. Then I fell on my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Oh, Lord God, will you make a complete end to the remnant of Israel? So as this is taking place, uh, he sees this man die, and it so upsets him that he begins to fear that everybody's going to die. He's wondering if that remnant that God had spoken about in chapter 9 is even going to survive, and that's why he says, Is everybody going to die? Well, in verse 14, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and though I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they will go there, and they will take away all its detestable things and, its, and all its abominations from there. And then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh and they, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and, and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for the detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. So the people of Jerusalem are saying to those in exile, you're not God's people. The exiles are on foreign soil, so obviously God has forsaken them. In their way of thinking, since they're still in Jerusalem, they're being protected by God. But God, in verse 16, says, uh, that's not true. Though I've cast them off, that doesn't mean that they're cast off forever. I'm going to be their sanctuary. They're going to have fellowship with me. And though my glory departs from the temple, my presence remains with those who love me. You see, in Ezekiel 37, 27, the Scripture says, My tabernacle also shall be with them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And so God is saying, I'm going to remain amongst them no matter how it may appear. And so God says, I'm going to gather you from the peoples. I'm going to assemble you. So God is going to bring back the captives. This is a foreshadowing that occurs later in Ezra, it also occurs in Nehemiah, but it's a picture of what happens in the last days. God is going to bring those who've been scattered and restore the nation of Israel. And it's going to be more in these last days than just a secular nation. It's going to be a nation that ultimately is filled with those who love God and serve God. These are going to be the people who have the new heart and that new spirit. Notice how it says in verse 19, I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit with them. Take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments. What we're seeing right now in the, uh, in the uh, reestablishment of the nation of Israel is we're seeing a foretaste of what is going to take place when, when they actually do have a giant revival and the nation of Israel comes to faith in Messiah. It's just a foretaste. They have initial uh, uh, returnings that take place in the Old Testament, as I mentioned, Ezra and Nehemiah record that. But ultimately what happens, this is something that's really going to be fulfilled, and we'll see this later on in Ezekiel, uh, in the latter days. When the nation once again rises, and when the nation once again has the life of God in it, when the Spirit of God once again is within it, that's what he's speaking about when he says you're going to have a new heart and you're going to have a new spirit within you. Now, Jesus on one occasion was speaking to a very scholarly man, a man by the name of Nicodemus who was a ruler of the Jews. He was a leading expert in the law of Moses. He was a well-known uh, expert in the things of God. And, and he had come and spoken to Jesus on one occasion. And as he came to Jesus by night and began to speak to him, he had said, uh, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do the works that you do unless God is with him. 
And when Jesus was being spoken to by Nicodemus, Jesus cut through all of his, all of his talk and all of his fancy introduction and all of those kinds of things. And he said, unless a man's born again, he cannot see, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What are you talking about, Nicodemus says. How can a man be, uh, be, be born when he is old? Can a man re-enter into his mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus you're, says, you're a master of Israel. You don't know these things? You don't remember what God said to Ezekiel? You don't remember what God said to the prophet Jeremiah? How that God had stated that he would, he would, he would put his spirit within men, that he would write his law on the tablets of human flesh? Jeremiah 31, 33 says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Nicodemus, you don't remember the promises that God has given? That he is going to write his law on the tablets of human flesh? That these stony, unresponsive, dead hearts are going to be replaced by a living heart that is made possible through the Spirit of God, that you're going to begin to do the things of God, not because these, the laws are written on some page on a book or, or tablets of stone. You're going to be doing these things from the inner person because God is going to write His law on the tablets of your heart. You're going to do these things that are pleasing to God because God is going to put His Word in you and it's going to come out of you. So many people like the outside. They like these outer laws. They, if you can have a law that you can follow, you feel comfortable with it. If it's written down, if it's in some kind of code, then, then I'll just adhere to the code and that's going to give me some kind of security. Recently, somebody was wondering why I don't preach with a suit. I don't wear a suit when I preach because every man of God wears a suit. As much as I read the New Testament, I never found any indication that Jesus wore a suit when he was preaching. I don't think the Apostle Paul did. What's more interesting is they seem to wear dresses. Do you want me to wear a dress? <laughs> we get caught up with the outer appearance. We still do. We still do. If it's on the outside, if I can see it, I can trust it. God says, no. I'm going to take my law and I'm going to write it on the tablets of your heart so from the inside out you're going to love me and obey me. It's easy to give the appearance that you're following the code. The Pharisees during the time of Jesus did it very well to the degree that the disciples when Jesus said your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees the, the, the followers of Jesus his men said who can be saved? These are the most scrupulous religious people in the nation. They pray, they fast, they give. These are people who have broadened the, the hems of their garments and the thickness of the phylactery between their eyes. These are the people who wear every religious symbol that we know about. And you're telling us that we have to have a righteousness that is greater than that. Who can be saved? They're the most righteous appearing people in the nation. And Jesus said, <laughs> they may appear righteous, but they're like, they're like tombs. They're, 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 they're whitewashed on the outside, but inside they're filled with dead men's bones and all manner of decay. These people have the outer appearance. And Je that's why Jesus would say, you guys are hypocrites. You're like unmarked graves. People walking over you fall into you and they injure themselves because they can't even, they can't even see you because you're so well disguised. But you're a, you're a stumbling block to those who want to enter into the kingdom of God. So God says, listen, God says, I am going to write my law on the tablets of your heart. But there are some who don't want that. Verse 21, as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their detestable things, their abominations, I'll recompense their deeds on their own head, saith the Lord God. If they don't want me, then they will get judgment. So, verse 22 through 25, the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain. This is the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, back to Babylon, to those in captivity, 
and the vision that I had seen went up from me. So I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. You see a reluctance on the part of the Spirit of God as he's hovering there in the Mount of Olives to the east of the city as the glory of God has gone from the threshold, gone through the gate, is now there over the Mount of Olives, and the glory of God has departed. The glory of God has departed, and they don't even know it. And so what he does is he speaks to those in captivity of all the things that the Lord had shown him. He gave this message to those who were there in, in captivity. He gave them this message for their instruction, and he gave them this message for their consolation. And one last thought. I want you to see how he says in verse 25, I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. That is the heart, by the way, of verse-by-verse -verse teaching. That's the heart of it. All that the Lord has shown me. We get that by looking at the Word of God verse-by-verse. -verse. That's how that happens. That's how you get to know all that the Lord God showed to Ezekiel is through reading through and studying each one of these verses. As a faithful deliverer of the Word of God, Ezekiel made sure that he gave everything that God gave for him to give.